tonight on the final play. A leaping reception, touchdown, Sneed. The Saints get blindsided by a suspension but have reason to be optimistic at offensive tackle. We're recapping a flurry of roster moves and looking ahead to week one in Minnesota. Plus, LSU brings defense in the dome and flashes some offense as well, while all of our South Louisiana schools show plenty of promise in their openers. All of that, plus the best of the best from week one in prep football. From Fox 8 Sports, this is the final play. Sponsored by your Southern Quality Ford dealer. Built Ford Tough. And Nissan. Welcome into the final play. I'm Juan Kincaid. The preseason's over. So bring on the regular season because all 53 roster spots are accounted for. And for the Saints, it officially gets on the way a week from tomorrow night in Minnesota. For the most part, it was a preseason worth bottling. Not just winning for the first time in three years, but how they won. The tone was set early by a stingy defense. It's why the start of the regular season can't get here fast enough. Here's Sean Vazan. Ready or not, here come the 2017 New Orleans Saints. And they enter the regular season with a sense of cautious optimism. They appear to be better in key spots, but you never really know about a team until the games start counting for real. Preseason can often be misleading. For this team to have success, there's no two ways about it. They must start fast. At the end of the day, we have been unsuccessful in the season for three years now. And uh, I think what this team needs is to understand that we are good enough to go on a roll and to get on a run. And it's hard to do that when you lose early. Not having wide receiver Willie Sneed will hurt. His offseason arrest for DUI will cost him the first three games of the season. I know Mickey had talked with the league office today. And obviously, when it involves a player suspension to start the season, clubs are made aware of it, and you have to adjust your roster accordingly. That roster came together Saturday and has remained fluid as the team claimed both wide receiver Austin Carr and quarterback Taysom Hill off waivers. They temporarily released John Kuhn and Daryl Tapp to make room for them. Both are expected to return. On a positive note, Teron Armstead will be on the roster to begin the season, not PUP, which signals major progress in his recovery from a shoulder injury. The team also appears to be sticking with former first-round linebacker Stephon Anthony. Despite missing significant playing time in the preseason, Anthony is still on the 53, at least for now. So as of right now, the final 53-man roster seems to be done, but it's still very fluid, Sean Vazan. When you look at the roster moves they've made so far, what's your biggest surprise? Man, the, I really did not see the Trey Edmonds move coming. I, I had him probably dead last in the pecking order uh, along the running back depth chart. I thought Darius Victor Ashley outplayed yeah, him. Good. Um, so he's on the roster for now. I did not see that coming. That could change by the time we finish the show tonight. But uh, I, I think the Trey Edmonds was probably the most surprising move. It's not terribly surprising that the Saints would stick with Stephon Anthony. I just thought he was outplayed during yeah. the preseason, and there's a lot of numbers at that linebacker position, so I'm coming back as well. He seemed to be injured quite a bit as well. When you look at the positions that's the deepest on the football team, where do you look first? First off, running back. The running back position, you got Mark Ingram. You got Adrian Peterson. Uh, you have Alvin Kamara, Daniel Lasco. We mentioned Edmonds as well. So I like the running back position. There's versatility. There's, there's depth. And there's just there's a good flow, ebb and flow of those guys uh, at the running back position. Also at safety line, I don't think we've talked yeah. enough about them. Kenny Vaccaro, Marcus Williams, Von Bell, Raphael Bush, Chris Banjo, yeah. uh, the safety that can also play special teams as well. Those two groups right there, two of the deepest groups on the roster. And they're also deep at linebacker. We no didn't doubt. even get to that part. We've been talking about that all offseason. Okay, so if you're thick in certain areas, you're going to be thin elsewhere. Where at? Well, the good thing about this roster is there's no glaring weakness in terms of numbers, but they are a little light in numbers uh, at defensive tackle. They only have four. They didn't keep the veteran Tony McDaniel. Again, that could change as we get closer and closer to game week and into the season, but they only have four defensive tackles. It's a good group, don't get me wrong, but they got some versatility with some of their ends. Uh, but to only have four right now, that was the biggest thing that stood out to me in terms of the thinness at a certain position. So as we go into the regular season now, we're looking at the countdown to game one, Monday night in Minnesota. Defense is where we're looking at first because that's been the problem area for this team for so many years. Are they better defensively based on what we've seen in the preseason? You know, yes. I I'm confident in saying that this defense is better. How much better yeah. is to be determined. Yeah. Now look, don't look at yards. 
the, the, don't look at any your, your standard stats. There's two areas where they must get better. If they're better in these two areas, they will win games. One is red zone defense. Keep the opponent out of the end zone. The other, we know it. Take the ball away. If you can get some extra possessions for this offense, that's all you need defensively, and you can be, uh, this team can win a lot of games. It's a formula for success now in the NFL, not just with the Saints. On the other side of the ball, we only got to see Drew Brees for one game, that being game number three, which is expected. They didn't get into the end zone. Is there a concern over not getting seven points from this first team offense in the one time we saw them? None whatsoever. Okay. This offense is going to figure it out. Even if it takes them a game or two, they are going to be a top five offense as they've always been under Sean Payton. Uh, Drew Brees is still Drew Brees. He's got a multitude of weapons, as he always seems to do, and he always seems to get the most out of everyone. He makes them all better around him. So I think this offense is going to be just fine. But it's not going to be just fine or completely whole because, you know, you got Willie Sneed's suspension happening in the first three games of the season. How might that affect what this offense can do and how effective they can well, be? Well, look, Willie Sneed moved the sticks. I mean, he knows where to be. You know, if it's a third and eight, he runs a nine-yard route. If it's a, you know, a, a second and 12, he, get, he makes sure he gets enough depth on his route. He's a very smart player. Uh, Drew Brees trusts him, which is the most important factor on this offense for any skill position players. Earn the trust uh, of Drew Brees and Sean Payton. So I think it is going to be a little bit of a concern because, look, they need, they need that reliable player. You're going to be on the road two out of the first three uh, games there. So it's going to be tough, but I think they'll be able to manage without Willie Snead. How did they remedy that? Remedy that? Who without Willie Snead? Tommy Lewis? Brandon Tommy Coleman? Tommy Lewis more is, is more of a speed guy. I don't know if he's a, he's a possession type guy. Maybe the new guy. Austin Carr, if they can get him acclimated quickly. He had a very good preseason with New England Patriots, so that's a name to consider as well. What's your biggest concern for this football team either side of the ball? Right now, you know, it's not really this team. It's this division. Mm -hmm. They're in the yeah. NFC South. Yeah. You have Carolina, who is, I think is going to be better. You have Atlanta coming off a Super Bowl uh, uh, appearance. And you also have Tampa Bay, who is the sexy pick around the NFL mm -hmm. on hard knocks right now uh, to be that up-and-coming team to really make a statement this year. And they keep up. So it's very possible the Saints are better, but don't make any ground in the NFC South because NFC South is so tough. Okay, so give me your prediction. We've reached that point oh, in the season where we have, we're about we? eight days away from the opener. So they're going to be better. I think they're going to start a little bit better. I think they're going to start two and two in the first four games of the season. Which is the most important Which thing. Which is most important. Team. Right now, I, I cannot go any more than nine and seven okay. and battling for a wild card spot. We'll see if they get on a roll and maybe make a run. But right now, nine and seven, a two game improvement from last year. He's been changing back and forth <laughs> for, throughout the offseason. Nine and seven is not bad. I'm still saying 10 and six okay. as a football team. We shall see. That's Sean Vazan. We'll be back in a minute. And this reminder of some programming we have coming your way this week. With it finally being game week for the Saints, our first black and gold breakdown kicks off Thursday night during Fox 8 News at 10. The team's opener is Monday night in Minnesota, so Jim Henderson's work with us picks up on Tuesday with his black and gold rewind at 8 a.m. His commentary will come your way at 5 p.m. And Tuesday night, season three of Jim Henderson's black and gold review kicks off at 10.35. We're just getting started here on the final play. Up next, the college football season is underway. And what a start by the LSU Tigers as they brought their show to the Superdome to battle BYU. And Tulane made it look oh so easy against Grambling State. We're recapping a busy first weekend of football in the boot when the final play continues. The college football season is now in full swing, and one of the last teams to take the field Saturday night, the LSU Tigers, who announced their arrival with word of 13 players being suspended. But based on how they just dominated BYU, their lack of playing experience didn't show. Chris Hagan wraps up the Tigers' shutout win over the Cougars. And now Entley on play action. Down the middle of the field, has a man wide open, waiting for it. Catch grabbed at the 10-yard line by DJ Chark. The main draw was LSU's offense, led by their new coordinator, Matt Canada. But the real star of the show was something we've seen for quite some time now, the Tigers' relentless defense. When you're in that defensive staff room with Dave Aranda, and you come in, and he has this little notebook, and he has about 30 pages of notes every day. And you see the type of athletes we count, we have. It just looks like it's all coming together. And uh, for those guys, I'm just so proud of them. The way they practiced, the way they prepared, 
And obviously, we've got some things that we need to get better at, but to hold them under 100 yards, total offense is fantastic. Most impressive about the defense was how well they played without several key starters. Of course, that's also thanks to some big plays from their freshmen. Tyler Taylor stepped up in place of Donnie Alexander at linebacker, while Greedy Williams started for the suspended Kevin Tolliver at corner and made a huge interception down the sideline. They may be new names to fans, but to their teammates that saw them all summer, it's what's expected. There's a lot of guys that have stepped up, and uh, they understand their role, and they want to, you know, they want to do great things. When we go in there and you do it day in, day out during camp, you know, spring ball, summer, whatever it might be, and you do it consistently, you have the confidence to do it, and then when you go to a game, you're ready to go. We pride ourselves of uh, being, you know, top-tier defense every year. You know, we just want to send a message to the rest of the country, you know, that, um, that we believe that we are the best defense. You know, we pride ourselves on making big plays, playing gap assignment, you know, just playing hard nose tough football. Pride being the key word there. Because sure, the Tigers could have eased up late, but the chance to hold BYU to negative five yards on the ground was too good to let slip away. We saw it. We kept looking at the scoreboard, and it was like negative one rushing yards, zero rushing yards. It was like, hey, it don't matter who you play. If you can do that, that's special. Special, however, isn't exactly the word you'd use to describe the Tigers on offense, though it was at least improved. 57 running plays to just 18 pass attempts is very reminiscent of the old regime. But under Canada, it was much easier to watch as the Tigers completed 83% of their throws. I know he has some more things that he wants to get better at, obviously, but uh, I thought he did a great job of managing our whole offensive staff. And uh, he calls those games, and he's on that headset, and he's enthusiastic, he's very knowledgeable, A+. Because Canada has his own style of the way he does things. You know, we could have threw it 50 times, you know. He wanted to run it, you know. Like, he came at halftime and told us, you know, we're we going to take what they give us. If they give us the run, we're going to run it, you know. If they play, you know, soft and, and laid back, we're going to run it, you know. So he, we just did what they was giving us. And with that, we're now joined by Andrew Lopez of NOLA.com, the Times pick Yoon, and we just watched a very dominant performance from the Tigers. What are your first takes from this 2017 edition of LSU? Dave Aranda is a genius. Uh, it doesn't seem to matter who is on this defense. Obviously, there was a lot of guys missing in terms of backups, a couple of starters tonight, Donnie Alexander, Kevin Tolliver, but it didn't seem to matter for Dave Aranda. You put in, I think, three true freshmen, get the, action, get the starts tonight, and they still hold this BYU team under 100 yards. The first time under 100 yards since 2014. Minus five rushing yards, the fewest have allowed since 1982. So to me, that just says that Dave Aranda is going to put these guys in the right positions no matter who's out there on the defense. And that means that you could almost argue that the offense is going to be how far the Tigers go this year because, look, the defense is going to get the job done. There are not a whole lot of offenses out there that will have a lot of success against them. So how do you grade what we saw on the offensive side of the ball for Matt Canada's new offense? You know, I think it's it's, it's kind of like a B-plus type night. You saw a lot of the, the formation shifts and the jet sweeps and the things like that, but you didn't see maybe the point totals that you wanted. I think they get inside the red zone and they don't convert the way they want to. You, you miss a field goal. You have to settle for two short field goals. I think they want to see more points on the board. I think they might have felt like they left a lot on the board tonight. So that's why I think you, you, you can't give them an A just yet, but it's it's in progress and it's growing. And I think you can see all the sure telltale signs of an offense that can, can grow in the future. Yeah, should LSU fans take solace in the fact that there was such a big yardage differential from LSU to, to BYU, or should they be a little alarmed that they look kind of lost in the red zone at times? I think you have to focus more on the fact that you almost outgained a team rushing by 300 yards. Granted, it's 294 to minus 5, but still, if your defense is going to perform like that, your, your offense only needs to have 27 to 30 points a game. Uh, you, you obviously win tonight 27-0, to and I think what you're ultimately going to see is more games that you're going to get into the 30s. You're going to start to creep up a little bit as the season gets on. Th these guys, it's still a new offense. We saw early penalties that kind of took them out of action a little bit, but as this season goes on, this offense is going to continue to put up more yards and more points as they get comfortable. Of course, one of the things that stuck out in what Ed Ogeron said after the game is that Matt Canada's play sheet on offense is huge, and that they only really got to about 10% of it against BYU. Are you buying that, or do you think maybe the offense just wasn't comfortable opening it up quite yet? Talked to K.J. Malone after the game, and he said that it was the plan all along for them to go and, and be physical. Uh, I don't know if he thought it was going to be almost 60 rushing attempts to only 18 passing attempts, but they took what the defense gave them, and 
when, when BIU was going to let them run, they're going to run, and they're going to run, and they're going to run. And it was so successful. Darius guys, 20 carries in the first half. Darrell Williams finishes it off in the second half. So when you're that successful at it, I can only see why you're going to continue to do it. And another thing I think Tiger fans should you know, be happy about is that, look, there were a lot of players missing on that defensive side of the ball, key players, but the freshmen probably had some of the best games when you look at Kerry Vinson and, you know, young guys like Greedy Williams and uh, Kalevon Chason, just guys that were able to get in and produce right away. What does that say about, you know, just how much talent there is on that side of the ball? You're, it, it was funny. We talked to John Battle after the game and we asked him, what's this, what's this defense going to look like when Arden Key comes back? And he just started laughing. He was like, not going to lie, didn't realize he, we didn't have him until you mentioned we didn't have him. That's how dominant this defense looked. These, these guys, these freshmen, they're ready to play, whether they're redshirt guys like Greedy or whether they're, they're true freshmen like Tyler Taylor. Tyler Taylor helped set the tone of the game with his tackle. His, it, was, it wasn't a tackle for a loss, but it was a no gain on the second play of the game. So these freshmen can play, and I think they're just going to plug and play. And if, if I'm a guy who, who missed this game tonight for whatever reason I did, it's going to be hard for me to, to get back into this rotation. Last thing, you, you've got to look at the facts. And look, BYU may be a bowl team at the end of the season, but they're far from the best team that LSU is going to see this year. So that said, where does LSU have to get better when they're going to face more athletic and faster opponents? Have to get better in the red zone. Uh, there was a part, I think, tonight where you had six red zone opportunities, only two touchdowns. You, you went, you had a turnover on downs, a missed field goal. You have to get better in those. You have to shut down on these penalties. A lot of early penalties early on that just aren't going to help this team. But I think what you need to do is if you can get, get some of those red zone points back, you'll be okay. You're going to hit the big plays eventually. Obviously, you hit the big 52-yarder to Shark. You had a big 32-yarder to Russell Gage. Those plays are going to come if you make people respect that run. Uh, that's what BYU did when they started respecting the run. They would hit them over the top. And as they become more comfortable, more points will come. Certainly a lot to look forward to in the Ed O era at LSU. Thank you, Andrew Lopez no of Nolan.com and Tom Spicky-Yoon for joining us. Can't stop relishing the season opening victory? Head to our news app or website and check out a photo gallery from last night full of highlights on the field and in the Superdome stand. The Tigers weren't the only ones with a presumed tough opener. Tulane tried to shake off Grambling State uptown, while Nichols, Southeastern, and Southern look to kick off their seasons with a win as well. We'll run down all of it next. Welcome back into the final play, and week one of the college football season came to a close early today with Southern hosting South Carolina State in the MEAC Swag Challenge. Southern striking first, John Curtis alum Devin Ben takes the delayed handoff up the middle for six. His 27-yard touchdown makes it 7-0 Jags. 7-3 Southern into the second quarter. West St. John alum Austin Howard with a fantastic fake. Strolls into the end zone for a six-yard touchdown. Jags led 14-3. They opened the season with a win. 14 to 8, your final score. <sighs> Meanwhile, uptown Saturday night, and what a start to the college football season for Tulane as they pushed aside Grambling State with relative ease. A year ago, it was the beginning of the Willie Fritz era. One year later, and all eyes were on the quarterback that Fritz believes can take the wave to the next level. And Jonathan Banks did not disappoint. Not only did he run the ball well, 16 carries, 84 yards, and a touchdown. But he threw it very well against the Tigers' secondary, completing 10 of 15 passes for 185 yards and three more scores. The Greenies' offense ran up 481 yards in their 43-14 win. By the way, the 43 points scored their most since 2011, and the win gave the Wave their first home opening victory since 2013. It gets much harder next week when Tulane plays its first road game at Navy. If the first weekend is any indication, Southland Conference football will be fun to watch this season. The Southeastern Lions went into UL Lafayette and nearly pulled off the upset. The Lions and Raging Cajuns went back and forth on the scoreboard, and defense was optional as the two teams combined to score 99 points. And you had to watch this one to the very end to get the winner because the Lions scored with a minute left in the game, pulling to within 49-48. So they decided to go for two and the win. It went horribly wrong. Fumble, returned by the Cajuns for two more points, 
and they win it 51 to 48. Well, you know, uh, I think this game is going to be a, a huge learning tool. Uh, of course, we're going to get better from it. Tomorrow we have film, so we're going to look at all the mistakes we made, and uh, we're just going to get better from it. As we look back on college football's opening week, one of the surprise standout games was Thursday night's matchup between Nickel State and McNeese State. The Colonels led by a ton of local talent, like quarterback Chase Forcade and his four total touchdowns. He put on a show and knocked off the Cowboys with a last-second field goal. It's the perfect start to what should be a huge sophomore season for 4K. Uh, you know, I'm really happy about how we, how we finished. We kept punching like Coach said. You know, that's been our motto all um, fall camp. And uh, we, was really, we really live by that. We, we, we live by what Coach says and, uh, and it shows. No matter what the outcome was, no matter what the circumstances were, we all held together. We played as a team and we won as a team, man. It feels good. It's magical. Yeah, I'm telling y'all, man, y'all better get on the bandwagon. Our South Louisiana teams are all back in action next Saturday. Tulane starts the slate at Navy, and then Nichols will look to duplicate the fight they put up against Georgia last year when they hit the road to Texas A&M. LSU makes their Baton Rouge debut against UT Chattanooga, while Southeastern hosts Bethune-Cookman. When we continue, prep football is back with a Sunday matinee affair and some top performances. Welcome back into the final play. Legendary coach Wayne Reese Sr. and Mac 35 taking on St. Aug at Gormley today. St. Aug's Ishmael Sanders coughs the ball up. Ron Eagles' Joe Fusha. He recovers. That would lead to Mac 35, fourth and goal from the six. LeJean Howard, the quarterback, looking to pass. He ends up running it. He is stoned at the one yard line. Purple Knights with a big stop. More St. Aug defense. Howard going deep, but Derek Pinckney, Jr is waiting on the other end. He gets the interception. Sounding like a broken record. Once again, Howard going deep. Another INT. This time is Daniel Ward-McGee. In the third quarter, scoreless still, St. Aug's Michael Mims connects with Joseph Walker. Finally on the board, a 27-yard score, and that was your only score of the game. St. Aug get the win, 6-0. And from Thursday night's action, an early vote for catch of the year comes from Devonta Jason for Landry Walker. One hand touchdown grab on this toss from Torrey Cargo, but not enough for the charging bucks to beat John Curtis. And that's our show for tonight. For all of us here at Fox 8, I'm Juan Kincaid. Hope you'll join us again next Sunday night for the final play. From Fox 8 Sports, this has been the final play.